going to tell a lot of stories about uh, being labeled a domestic terrorist and, and the war on terror in the United States. I'm going to talk also about political prisoners in this country. Um, but one, I just want you to remember, I'm a community organizer and that, that the stories I tell are about people like all of us, ordinary people compelled to extraordinary situations to do things. And the reason I talk about these things, um, I'll talk about some of my narrative, is not because I want to create hero myths around any of these people or myself, is that hopefully you'll see yourselves in this. And that by the time you leave here, you won't be afraid of the state. Because no matter what we do, if we keep our eyes on the prize, it doesn't matter what the state does and we should not let them scare us, right? There's, there's definitely pitfalls along the way, but that does not define us. And, and also I'm gonna talk about things, and you have to understand that I have an incredible amount of privilege being a white male in this country to be able to talk about these things because I've never gone to prison. A lot of my friends have been to prison for a long time for their political activities. And I want to, I want to just recognize that I have a lot of privilege in doing this. So with that, I'm going to kind of move through some things kind of quickly. So take notes if you want. And anything I say, take what you want, leave the rest. It doesn't matter. I'm not here to sell anything. I just want, to, want us to think about these things. So what, what is terrorism, especially in the context of what we do now? and who defines what terrorism is. I think it's an important question to start with because terrorism, in my estimation, is not really mean anything. It's a very vague term. How did we as civil activists become terrorists? How did communities of color and marginalized communities, how did they become terrorists? Who does control the narrative? Corporations and governments, right? For the people who attended Lauren Reagan's talk earlier, this guy Ron Arnold that she mentioned uh, earlier is the person who coined the term eco-terrorism in the 80s. It's a pretty early term to use that. And I would, I would argue that civil activists who want to stop the destruction of the planet and destruct, destruction of animals and, and, the and everything on it would not, are not terrorists, but they were defending that. So that's kind of the premise of where I'm working from here. So here's some, defin here's some loose definitions. There is no statute that names one thing of terrorism and what terrorism is, actually. It's really muddled. And it, it used to be that we thought about people who were hijacking planes and were killing people or driving planes into, into buildings that would kill people. But how did it become that property destruction became that? So here's a loose definition from a, one government place. It's associated with unlawful use of violence or threats of violence by non-state agents. Uh, non-state agents would be all of us. It's intended to instill widespread fear in civil society beyond those targeted. Well, I mean, that's what corporations, I feel like, do to me and governments do to me regularly. And here's one that's used by some security corporations. It's used to force change in government policy or cause economic loss for corporations. Well, dang, I mean, if I was a multinational corporation, I would, I would totally love that one. Here's two visceral acts that, are, that, that people are committing in the, in the cause of what they believe in. This one on, on, on my left killed thousands of people, shook up a country. Right? Can we agree with that? This one on the right is a, is a lone person destroying property. Destroying property and killing lives, is that the same thing? Do we even need to have that discussion? Property destruction is not violent. It's property. You know? Let's be real about it. Destroying property is not the same as killing people or threatening to kill people. And the Earth Liberation Front, the Animal Liberation Front movements in the United States, um, and animal rights, environmental movements in general, nobody's ever getting killed. And nobody's being threatened with death either, no matter what the corporations and, the, and governments are saying about this. So how did, how did acts of property destruction, at whatever, it, whatever it was, how did it get equated with this? Well, I'm going to go back just a little bit. I'm not, going to, I'm not a history professor. I'm not an anthropologist. I'm an organizer. But I want to look back for a second because we have to know our history to know where we come from. And movements in this country have always faced resistance to, the, to those who are, have power on top. All grassroots movements have always done that. It's important because we are resisting their, their dynamics of their control over the rest of us and the planet and, and for exploitation. So, but I'm going to talk about more recent history of, of the Quanto Pro. Everybody knows about Quanto Pro, the counterintelligence program, how they killed people, targeted groups like the Black Panther Party, the American Indian Movement, the Brown Berets, how they really helped to destroy those movements. And they did it because they were challenging power with a capital P. 
And you know, it supposedly came out in the, in the early 70s that we, uh, that we stopped, uh, the counterintelligence program was brought to a grinding halt and, and all of a sudden America was really free. And we know what happened political movements after that, right? So we start moving into the 80s, people who are in solidarity with people in South America are totally targeted by this movement. Also, we have a lot of people who are in prison from the 70s, from black liberation movements, Puerto Rican movements, uh, women liberation movements, all of these movements, there's, there's many of them, I can't even name all of them. And we ended up with this legacy of political prisoners, right? People who have been in for a long time in this, in this country. Does, do people know about political prisoners? Raise, give a show of hands of people who know about political prisoners in this country. Yeah, I didn't learn about them until 1985. And it's people like Marilyn Buck, who's gone on to the ancestors, and, and the Angola Three, who I've done a lot of support for for a long time. You know, the people who gave their lives for liberation in this country, for whatever it meant for them at that time, anti-racist, anti-imperialist, whatever it was, for collective liberation for all of us that are still in prison, and we should always give them support. But, but it didn't end, right? Because what we were talking about into the 80s, how things started to move, move forward, and they started targeting other groups for this. And we move on to the 90s and we start, you know, Earth First is born and a bunch of uh, animal rights movements really spring up in the, in the United States in the late 80s. I mean, really. Um, and animal liberation and earth liberation are in the fronts of people's minds. And people are moving forward. And then, and then Judy Berry, who was a, a union organizer with IWW, and Daryl Cherney, uh, who are both Earth First activists, are bombed. You remember that happened? Who bombed Judy Berry? Was it the government? Or was it the corporations? or where they're working hand in hand, you know? But the repression on the extreme end of trying to assassinate people was, was one part of it, but the repression of activists was still continuing, and it continued to grow. In my own trajectory, I'd, I started working on animal rights uh, movement in 1988. I'd become vegan and vegetarian, started working on animal liberation. I started working on environmental movements in about 18, in 1989 or 1990. In 1999, I was first visited by the FBI at my place of employment, a worker antique co-op that I had in, in Dallas, Texas. It was the first time I ever heard the words animal rights and domestic terrorism used at the same time. Now that's pre-September 11th, isn't it? Because there's another current that's going on. Corporations are starting to control the narrative and they're starting to come up through the 80s and 90s to limit what we would do to stop their exploitation of the planet and animals. And they start on this legislation called the Animal Enterprise Terrorism Act. In Oregon, y'all have this logging act. Basically, if you stop logging that you, and you interrupt their business and interfere with their, their profit for expo by exploitation, that is terrorism. And these are all pre-September 11th. I was charged with that act in uh, 2003. But what happened in Quintal Pro, besides the assassinations and the disruption, was a lot of surveillance was gathered on, on all of us uh, and, and political movements. But I want, to, I want to argue that what was happening then and what continues today is much larger than it ever was then. The only thing that's missing right now is assassination. And let's hope that it stays that way. But the fear, the repression, the political imprisonment still continues to this day. So now I'm gonna move on to a section called growth of the intelligence industry. And I use the words intelligence definitely quote unquote because I think they're stupid as shit. They refer to themselves as intelligence agencies, not us. September 11th just caused an excuse for, for all, these, all these corporations that have been salivating and all these law enforcement reactionaries to really just push an omnibus in through. And it was called the Patriot Act. Remember that? It wasn't very patriot-like, was it? It was about restricting freedom and liberty, wasn't it? About free speech didn't mean anything, criminalization of dissent. What if it really was about a bunch of things and it wasn't just about really stopping terrorism? You know, there's been a lot of terrorist acts uh, supposedly committed in this country, but out of the 500 cases, only about four or five of them were actually terrorists. Were, like, these are people who actually, remember the guy who stuck the bomb in his underwear and the guy who put it in his shoe and then there was the guy in the New York Times, that, that's three, that's three. And I think there's one other one, but all the rest of them were not that. If you're going to have a war on terror, and it's going to become one of the biggest things that you ever do, you've got to round up some terrorists, don't you? What if it's a war on us? Not just political activists, but a war on us as people in this country. So the, the surveillance industry has grown phenomenally. From 2001 to 2008, its budget increased to $75 billion. I'm going to run through some stats real quick. 
think about this, it's $75 billion of government money, but it's not just the government that we have to, have to deal with. Private corporations are making a fortune off of this. Every time that they, they wiretap something, Sprint makes money, AT&T makes money. There's a revolving door of people who work for, for the, the FBI or the CIA or, or those agencies go work for private security firms and then get hired back as contractors. There's a lot of money to be made in here. And we always are concerned about what the government is finding out, but private corporations don't even have the same laws to, to adhere to, to make sure that um, they are not breaking our, our, our civil rights. And let me, let me explain that when I'm talking about our civil rights, I'm not talking about constitutionally protected because I'm talking about our civil rights as human beings on this planet. Because I don't need the Constitution to back up anything that I say. It's my inalienable right as a human on this planet and all of ours to struggle against injustice. And I want to be clear about that. So this revolving door goes around and having experience in, in the animal rights and environmental movements, I know how shady those, those guys are. Th these are ex-law enforcement people that will get into the gray area of things but they're also making a lot of money on it. Everybody's coming to the federal pork barrel and like it's, it's getting siphoned out. Stratfor, um, they're a big analysis uh, group that's based in Austin, Texas, where I am, and they've written a lot of reports on me, and I can tell you they never talk to me about them, and I think they're wrong. There's a lot of companies like that, the global, global security companies that have this private door. And in this revolving door too, uh, one of the, another instance that happened was that um, I worked for Greenpeace on the actions team and we organized this big action against ExxonMobil, largest company in the world. In doing this action, we always had protested, we had, had a campaign going on for a long time in the, starting in the late 90s. And in 2004, some documents were leaked, leaked to us and it said, ExxonMobil, Facebook. This is, uh, this is pre-Facebook, and it had pictures of all of my friends in it and myself. People who had done actions not related to just ExxonMobil, but to other cor corporations like Halliburton. And Stratfor is the one that put it together. So this is a revolving door. They're, ha they're giving this to law enforcement. This is in 2004. They're giving this to law enforcement. This information is being exchanged. There's supposed, to be an there's supposed to be a wall between that, but it's not. You remember we had the war on drugs, and the war on drugs was detrimental to marginalized communities and people that were destroyed by it. families, were destroyed by it. The prison industry has grown phenomenally. Well, the money's been taken out of the war on drugs, and it's been put into the war on terror. The war on drugs is not over yet, but it's, it's, it's dying comparatively. In the last eight or nine years, almost 4,000 government agencies have been created or reassigned to the war on terror. That's a lot. <laughs> that's, starting to, that's starting to get into like being as large as the Pentagon. 854,000 new jobs were created since, uh, since 2001, and that's a 2008 figure. There is Obama's job package right there. The war is on us, but somebody's making money on it. So who are the tar targets of current U.S. domestic terrorism agencies in this, in this country? You know, in, in my own trajectory, I found out that I was listed uh, as a domestic terrorist in 2006. Now, I was not charged with this. I'd been doing political prisoner support with Angola 3 for a number of years before that. I'd been visiting Herman Wallace in Angola prison for five years before that. In 2006, I was unceremoniously kicked off of his list, and the, the little paper said, due to information received from outside law enforcement agency. Herman was going to have a, a trial, the first trial that that this man had had what, that didn't involve an all-white jury since 1973. It was an appeal hearing. We were going to go. A bunch of us in the Angola 3 support committee were going to go. And I decided not to go because I had to work. There was a SWAT team there. About 60 people showed up. And they wouldn't let the, the trial go on in the open. And it was due to information received from outside law enforcement agency. That's where I found out that I was listed as a domestic terrorist, an animal rights extremist and terrorist, and an environmental terrorist. And it's really funny because when I got the phone call, I was standing in uh, Home Depot buying uncertified wood. I was like, if they could see the irony of this, it was like, is this on camera? <laughs> it's like, so we start to look at these groups, like who has been targeted heavily since September 11th? And there's really four major categories. The largest one, the people who are being targeted the most by far in, in hundreds of cases are Muslims and people of Middle Eastern descent. And everything that I talk about today, we need to put that in our minds because I don't want to scare anybody about what happens in the political world, but that doesn't, is, is not squat to what happens into Muslim communities and people of Middle Eastern descent, who some of those people are my friends are in prison now. 
The second group, and the, the largest one, is animal rights and environmental groups and activists. We know about the Green Scare because it, it's, it's happened to our friends and people that we know and love and care about. And then the fourth group, which is political activists, us in general. But this repression comes at all different levels. Some of it is actually about trying to put us in prison. Some of it's just about control and trying to, trying to scare us. And that's political activists in general, but it's anarchists in particular. Most everybody who is in, in prison for animal rights and environmental related stuff is an anarchist identified person. Circle A means criminal, means terrorist. In my trajectory, I know you're thinking to yourself, wow, this guy must be totally badass, man. The FBI is all after him and everything. I'm a paper tiger. I fit the categories that justified their budgets. I help them to make money. They could spend a half a million dollars investigating me in nine states and 13 field offices. That justifies their paper pushing. It's bullshit. That's why I'm standing here today. Well, what about right-wing and anti-choice groups? Why are they not targeted? You know, militias form, they threaten judges, they kill people. Anti-choice people have blown up clinics, they have shot, assassinated doctors. Why aren't they on the list? There's a long history in this country of governments backing right-wing groups, either financially or by complicity of not doing anything about the things they did. In New Orleans, when I took up guns against white militias, it's because the white militias were getting complicit support from the, the police in New Orleans to kill black people. You know, like I said, white supremacists, they, they've been blowing things up. They've assassinated radio personalities. Besides lynchings and all of these things, why are they not on this list? Much, much more dangerous. So why? It's all about power, money, and fear. Power, because larger capital P power structurally wants to keep the power that they have above what they think is us. What I'm going to argue is that we will not give them that power. Money, it's all about money. Remember the $75 billion we talked about? That was just scratching the surface. I didn't even talk about all the, the local economy money that's coming in. You've seen the militarization of the police. We've seen the, what happens in the militarization of the police are killing young black youth in, in marginalized communities all over this country. And fear, that's the largest thing. If we start to fear them, we'll stop doing the things that we do. But why would we want to do that? I'm going to go into some cases and what they revealed. And I'm going to talk about just in really broad terms. I've, I've talked a little bit about my case. In my case, over a, uh, about a nine year period, they collected 1,200 pages from 2001 to 2008 and listed me as these things, environmental terrorists, animal rights, what we talked about. I was investigated in 13 field offices in nine states for arson all across this country. There's been five informants in my life. The most famous one is that asshole named Brandon Darby. Y'all remember that guy? Yeah. Well, he was the second person who tried to put me in prison for a crime. Uh, the one before that was a guy named Chris Plummer. That guy was a cooperating informant. And he tried to get me to blow up these statues in Houston, Texas in 2001, right after he got out of prison. He was going to provide the key. He knew where the warehouse was. It was these statues of presidents that were going to be installed in this theme park. And he was going to provide the dynamite. And I hearken back to what Judy Berry uh, Earth, of Earth First had said. She's like, you can always tell the FBI agent because they're the one who wants to bring the dynamite. <laughs> so I didn't do it. In 2006, <laughs> that's why I'm standing here today, y'all. <laughs> you know, I've been under, under the things that people fear the most. They tap my telephone, they tap my internet. They'd been monitoring where I'd been going uh, for a long time. I'd been at a closed circuit television. And the informants I had weren't all men. I had two women informants in my life, and they're spread out across the country. There's one in Detroit. If anybody knows anybody in Detroit, I am dying to find out who that informant is because I can't figure out who it is. And there's one in Dallas. And they use pen registers and trap and trace. They, uh, and they did trash covers. They went, through my, they went through my trash in a couple of houses I lived in. All my known relations were investigated. Uh, they subpoenaed all the utilities, mortgage, and bank records. Uh, I was investigated for the IRS. They wanted, me to, they wanted to get me for tax evasion. But being a good anarchist, I had paid my taxes all along because I didn't want to go out like that. <laughs> uh, they visited my business and my homes numerous times. The first time was in 1999 when they tried to embarrass me in front of my business partners. Uh, that continued for a long time. It almost became hilarious at, at some points. And threats of grand juries. Some of you have been grand juried, it's not funny. But because it's a, it's a very, very scary th uh, form of control that they try to use to either threaten you or to get you to, to compel you into the grand jury where you're scared shitless because you can't have a lawyer. People know that you cannot have a lawyer in a grand jury, right? And, and even if they don't, aren't targeting you, they can start gathering on fishing expeditions, starting to gather information. 
I stopped flying in 2006 until this last year because I couldn't get on a damn plane. Hour, two hour interrogations every time. Uh, they went through my shit over and over again. Um, I'm misconnecting flights. Uh, it was just too much. So I just stopped flying. Information was shared between private security and state agencies. I cannot tell you enough. Remember, that's a, a revolving door. An older activist told me this a long time ago. It doesn't matter who the person is, what agency they're from, if their interests are not the same as yours. Because if we spend all our time trying to figure out if they're the FBI or the JTTF or their, or their private corporate security, it doesn't matter. After a few cases, in, in Austin we did, a, we did FOIAs on, on 40 people, about 40 organizations, and events going back about 10 years. And then because of all the green scare stuff that's happened, we started to see all these other cases have started to come up, and we started to look at thousands and thousands of documents uh, from people around here. But I can tell you, of all the electronic surveillance, all of the, the overt spying and everything, informants are their best source. Hands down. All the security culture that you want to use about, you, you know, like PGP and stuff like that doesn't mean crap compared to informants. All it takes is one person flipping on you for whatever reason. Uh, agencies are taking too much information to develop critical analysis. One of the things that's happened uh, since September 11th and justifying their work is that they're taking in huge amounts of information and they can't process it because somebody has to look at it. They push a lot of duplicate and redundant paperwork. Thank you, government. <laughs> And then, quote unquote, intelligence and information gathered is pretty wide, but not very deep. One of the things that we're starting to, that we're figuring out is that they need to get, just like in the war on drugs, they need to get convictions to justify the budgets. This is all the little agencies that are happening within it, right? So it's like sheriff's departments getting federal funding. They got to have some domestic terrorists. They got to get convictions because they can't blow all the money just investigating people. So what they do is they gather a pretty wide swath of stuff that's not very deep, but then in a few cases they start targeting down. And then most of you in this room would probably uh, send out FOIAs. If you did them even correctly, would get nothing back. Or you might get one mention on one page in some, some document that means nothing, it has no relevance to anything, it doesn't say anything. We all want to think as political activists that like, yeah, man, we, they've totally got our number. They don't have shit. <laughs> they don't understand horizontal and decentralized politics or organizing structures. Huh, imagine that. <laughs> You know, one of the things that happened in, in the left in the, the 50s, 60s, and 70s is that they had power structures that this person was the boss, these people were the, the lieutenants, and this, it just kept on working down. Since we have a lot of decentralized structures, they can't organize, they can't figure it out. They always still, they still to this day want to figure out who's the boss, who's the ringleader. It's all of us. Aren't we all the ringleader? They do really sloppy work. You know, I carry guns. But I don't carry them around with me. I own guns. I'm from Texas. That's what happens. People have guns. And that's not a machismo thing at all. It's, it comes out, there's, a, there's a long culture of that. But I would never consider myself armed and dangerous because one, I don't carry guns on me all the time. You know, I, I, I'm also a gardener, but I don't carry shovels on me either. And that, I, they didn't mention that in, my, in the FBI reports. They misconstrue stuff to make it sound bad. So don't believe them. We should always question that. Anytime they say there's somebody's a terrorist, we should always question that. Just like the war on drugs. Anytime people are picked up and they say they got 60 kilos and knocked down this kingpin, kingpin I always was like, that is such a lie. We always should question those things. Uh, even with their vast resources, they still have limits on what and how they will allocate them. You know, remember, we think of the state as this one large entity, but it's really little, little fiefdoms and people want to maintain their power in it. And they're fighting amongst each other for the money. The DEA doesn't love p elements of Homeland Security because they, they compete for the same funds. Sheriff's departments are fighting with, with um, like in Austin, the University of Texas police for the same funds. So they don't want to waste their resources. And they don't have time to send informants to follow everybody. Only if they've targeted and they think they can get a, a conviction out of it. And then again, private securities and government agencies are revolving doors. It's the, it's the private security companies, I think, are the worst. This, so these are big places that sell this information, as, as well as harassment. Uh, um, some of y'all may be familiar with the Stop Huntington Animal Cruelty campaign. It was a very successful animal rights campaign. Very controversial because it wasn't built about, about building movements. There was another one called Dirty South Earth First. We targeted the people who made decisions at their homes, at their churches, at their schools, because we didn't want them to hide behind the bureaucracies of the state or corporations. Well, they hired security firms to stop us from doing it, as well as the government. So they got the revolving door of that. Of the 500 cases of domestic terrorism that have been tried and convicted in the, in the US since 2001, 243 of them uh, were targeted with the use of an informant. 
That's a pretty high percentage. 158 of them were arrested in a sting operation where the informant led the people to do things. Sound familiar? Um, and then this happens mostly in Muslim communities again. And 49% were nabbed by an informant who led the plot. So now we're on to this section. What can we do? Do we just curl up in a ball and say, man, screw it, we're, we're scared? No, what do we do? We, we don't want to curl up. We, we want to fight this, right? Because that's what we do really good. We know how to circle the wagons and how to move forward on these things. And that's what we're going to continue to do. So I'm going to talk about some ideas. And the first one I want to talk about more than anything is do not be afraid. Do not be afraid. I'm not saying that in our day-to-day -day life we're not afraid. But don't be afraid of the government. Don't be afraid of the corporations. Because if we give in to fear, they have already won. We'll start selling ourselves short. Instead of fighting for breadcrumbs and we say, we want, the, we want the bakery, or we want to build our own bakery, we'll, start, we'll say, the crumbs are pretty good. We must not be afraid. And I'm not saying that I haven't had amazing amounts of fear in my life. And I have privilege. I understand that the different communities have different things that happen to them. And we have different experiences in our life. But we cannot be afraid as movements. Remember, the counterterrorism complex is the largest, most inefficient bureaucracy has ever created. That works in our favor. The worst things that we fear only happen to a vastly small number of people. 15 or 20 cases in the Green Scare. It's just because it, we knew that they were, they were shams because the war on terror is a farce, right? But it only happens to small amounts of people in our communities. If you are targeted, it can be scary, but remain calm. It's really important. And, and let's not confuse if we engage in property destruction at a demonstration, that that automatically leads to terrorism. We're talking about a whole different level of things where we're targeted for, for long-term actions. So some of the uh, movement work we need to do is solidarity. Reach out and support those who are targeted or imprisoned. You know, there's a long history of political prisoners in this country, and we must continue to do support for those people for who've given up things for the struggle. Just because they're in prison doesn't mean they are not with us. And we are building on the work that they laid down for us to do from that. That's important to remember. It is long-term solidarity. It's not always fun. It's not always the most engaging. It's not always the most beautiful work, but it is important work. I do long-term support for long-term political prisoners, and I have for a long time, and I, it has enriched my life and my, my political understanding greatly. But we also must support and work in solidarity with the people who are being targeted now, especially outside of our political communities, to communities like in Muslims and people of Middle Eastern descent who don't have the political organizing and the history of the organizing that we have. They have their own but they, d they could use outside support. Being allies to them, I think, is really important. Um, and we need to practice appropriate security culture. Are we all pretty familiar with the term security culture? I have a lot of problems with it because it creates a, a subculture of inclusivity and cliquishness a lot of times. Listen, 99% of y'all are not doing clandestine actions. Don't act like we are. It's annoying. <laughs> You know what? If we, we need to build movements outside of our movement. We need to connect the struggles at all different levels, right? And if we're just being cliquish, that isn't going to do that. So when a soldier falls somewhere, that we can give them support in their community. So when a soldier falls in our camp, that we get support in that. And don't let the state divide us. You know, like in, in diversity of tactics, it's going to take all kinds of tools for us to make change in this, in the, in this world. It's all not going to happen one day, like one, two, three steps of revolution. We're all going to make it. The planet's going to be intact. Hell no, it's going to be long and messy in all kinds of ways. So don't let the state divide us. Even if you don't agree with the tactic, if it isn't affecting you, support those people unequivocally. Bad behavior is bad behavior. It doesn't matter whether somebody in your group is an informant. Kick their ass out. We don't have to be net, connect everybody. We want to be open and inclusive in our movement, but we don't have the resources. There's only a limited amount of us and time, money, and resources to do that. Refer them on if they need mental health help, refer them to places. If they need drug and alcohol help, refer them to places. One of the reasons I'm an anarchist is because I believe in small closed collectives, because I don't believe in the big boat theory. That's what got, got us in the mess anyway. I like small groups of people that can work together and so kick them out. And don't believe the hype, man. We think, I said this earlier, we think that they know everything, that they're gathering information. Man, Facebook, your iPhone, Twitter, that, all that stuff knows more about you than the government does. I guarantee you. If I could say one thing to the FBI, Google, learn how to use it.
<laughs> Some organizing we need to do is that we need to attend and conduct Know Your Rights trainings. Know about movement histories. Talk to people who have been targeted in these things. Learn from them. But also I think the trainings, being aware of these things and talking about them outside of our communities, not being scared of it, but talking about it outside of that. And like I said earlier, support diversity of tactics in the movements. It takes all kinds of actions. And maintain transparency. Transparency has been my protector. Because I move outside of political circles a lot in the work that I do. I, I work at an anarchist uh, worker-run cooperative. It's a recycling center. And I interface with lots of people because I, I know the people in my neighborhood. And when I was targeted and it finally came to the surface I was really being targeted, I had support from people who are not political activists, who are not engaged in struggles because they could see me as a rational, reasonable person. They knew me. And that's important. We need to think outside of our movement sometimes. And damn, man, we can't remember this. Lawyer up. If somebody's under attack, don't think, well, should I defend myself? Hell no, lawyer up, because that's what the state recognizes, and lawyers are good for that. All right, and this other one, use the media, grassroots and corporates to challenge the narrative. Uh, when Brad and David uh, were under attack from the Republican National Convention and were labeled as terrorists, we counterspun the media. Uh, and that kept working it, and we kept working it, and kept working it. And by 2010, after I got a bunch of my FOIA, uh, FOIAs from the FBI, I, I worked with the New York Times for nine months on an article. And when that article came out, there was, the, there was three components I wanted in it. One of them was to prom promote my book, which they wouldn't do. <laughs> but the other two were, were made more important was they, they made me, there, there's actually four things. The, the one was they made me seem like a rational, reasonable person. They made anarchism even though they liberalized it, they made anarchism seem like a rational, reasonable idea, and they made the FBI seem like fools. But it was worth the long-term investment. Instead of just going, screw y'all, I'm gonna let just spin out. I was like, let's work on this story to do that. But our grassroots media that we work really well, we need to continue to do that. We need to control the narratives. It's, it's very, very, very important. We need to re-spin these things because all we have is our emergency hearts and we want better worlds for everybody. That's what we want, right? That's the thing. We have compassion. We want to create something better. And we need to continue to tell those narratives about that. And I think the, the last thing I'll say right here is keep organizing for liberation, for collective liberation, not just for political liberation, but the liberation of everybody on this planet, humans, animals, and the planet. So keep organizing for liberation. All right, so I'm going to end it with this. Don't give in, don't give up, resist, rebel, create, and build. Thank you.